Cause this is not at all We were taught to fall in love Oh, in love, in love Come outside with me Let's get some privacy Who's in control oh, I'm losing Feeling kind of reckless And I don't wanna mess this up I'll mess it up Hello, hello, and welcome everybody to this lunchtime live. I'm so happy to be back. It's been a couple of weeks since we've been here. And today um, I have with me um, a good friend of mine, Ed Harris. Hello, Ed. Hi, Fanny. We'll be talking in a minute, but just to set the scene for everybody today, the idea of these conversations is, um, I, my name is Fanny Snaith, by the way. I'm a money coach, certified money coach. And my big mission is to open the door to conversation about money. I work with so many people who have um, strange relationships with money and not happy with the, their money situation, um, feel uncomfortable, awkward, dealing with their money, talking about money. How often is money the elephant in the room? But the thing to remember is, is that, that I've discovered through my work as a money coach is that money affects so many aspects of our lives and money actually gets the blame for an awful lot of things because whether we like it or not we actually attach all sorts of emotions to money some of us are really lucky and we have fantastic relationships with money and think you know what's the problem let's just go out and earn it and earn it and everything's fantastic but for others it's just not quite the same and i think that everybody has a, a right to a good financial education and I think part of that financial education is being able to communicate about money on a, on a level playing field so that we are able to actually openly express how we think and how we feel about it with the view that we can get better with it. So that's what these conversations are about, opening the door to the conversation about money. And today I have with me Ed, who I met three years ago, four years ago, something like that. Yeah, about three, I think. So the local school is over there. We won't say which which one it is. I suppose we could do. I don't know. But um, we, the local school is over there. And I was the business advisor for the Young Enterprise Scheme. And Ed was on the team for my second year there. And we had some fun, didn't we? Yeah, it was really good. Did you enjoy it? Tell us about tell us about the product that that your your team designed and made tell us a little bit about what happened with the with the young enterprise yeah so our team um wanted to provide something to educate people about the environment um uh, climate change and things like that and we thought our target audience should be children um and we thought that by educating children it would mean every that as they grow up they have an interest in the climate and an idea to keep the climate good and things like that um so we designed a book and designed an app um and managed to get it in places like Waterstones on Amazon. Um, and we ended up getting to the national final, I think. We did. Um, yeah. <laughs> Which was so exciting. We went, that was when we had, um, we went to London, didn't we? Yeah. And our local, and our, the thing is, you see, you're underselling yourself again, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> this is my one big challenge with this thing. The, the product that you came up with was wonderful because it was a book, but it wasn't just a book. It had QR codes in it and it had all other, all sorts of other things and which linked to YouTube videos. And you got an illustrator to do the beautiful pictures with it. And one of the team wrote the, with the, with the, 
text for it, which was all in rhyming. And it was a lovely, a lovely book, a really lovely book. But you, along with it, because we got Alex Chalk involved, didn't we? Who was our yeah. MP. And what happened to that? Because this is important too. Do you remember? Um, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I do remember. Yeah, so it was for us, I think, as well, it was all about building this brand around the business. Um, so, like, we had our products, but it was kind of like building a community and all that. Um, so, we got talking to Alex Chalk, um, and he ended up mentioning us in Parliament um, when he uh, introduced a bill about net zero emissions to um, 2030. So, we have a document of him saying uh, the team in Cheltenham. A young enterprise team in Chatham inspired him on this bill, um, so we've got that written in in uh, Parliament's documents now, which is good. So that and Parliament's documents are called Hansards, right? So we got into Hansards, which is a document that lasts forever, forever, forever. And what was so lovely is that Ren, my daughter, who was in the year your year, no year below, yeah, year be below, yeah. yeah. You know, she's studying criminology and she came home from college yes the other day and says, "Well, we're learning all about Hansards," and I went, "Well." <laughs> and I was talking about and she goes, really? She said, really? That was good. So you're 19 now. Yeah. You were doing your A-levels when you were doing, uh, when we were doing the Young Enterprise. But you had already, yeah. you'd already moved into the business world by that point. You're 19 now, right? So you, you'd you already yeah. moved into the business world. By the way, let me just say for anybody who's watching, and I know it only says one up there, but it doesn't always say that whoever's watching from Facebook, please feel free to put the comments in any questions that you've got for either myself or Ed. Um, and we, I, I can see them coming up, I think. So just, yeah, post them in. So you, going back to that, so you were doing the Young Enterprise, that's where we met at the local school, which is has a very good reputation, doesn't it, really? So we're yeah. lucky to have that school, I think. Um, I, I don't know what your view is on it. Maybe we can ask you that in a bit. But <laughs> you were already in business at that point. Yeah. What were you doing? Well, I think from a young age, I was always like dealing and wheeling and buying and selling all sorts of things and um, stuff like that. And then I slowly got involved in selling on Amazon, um, trying out some online websites, which made me money, but never enough for me to kind of like um, stop everything and go go for that. Um, but I've always been interested in kind of entrepreneurship and seeing business opportunities and things like that. So I did sustain, I worked on Amazon, and now I'm started a business in Mexico with my brother. Um, so I've always been kind of like interested in that space. What kind of business in Mexico? Can you talk about it? Yeah, so in the business in Mexico um, is uh, like Uber and Deliveroo. They deliver you uh, food and, and more so now they're delivering you groceries. For example, you can get groceries within 20 minutes. But the problem in, in Mexico is no one's really interested in getting um, groceries from Walmart and things like that. Uh, which is a supermarket out there. Instead, they want their local like market goods. Yeah. Um, so we go to the market and, and we have good connections in the market to buy cheap from the market and drive that to customers' front doors. And it took off quite well. We got to 250 customers and we've had to stop accepting new customers at that point because we are designing systems to like actually handle that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's like a grocery delivery business in Mexico. And um, where does your brother live? Uh, my brother lives in Guadalajara, in Mexico. Okay, so he's out there. So what's your role in the business? So my brother's the kind of people person. He goes and does the deals. He goes to speak to people. He's great with customers and he speaks Spanish. Um, so he's kind of like the front man. I speak no Spanish, but um, I, I can code and do things on computers that he can't do. So I'm kind of like the back end of the website and he's the front end. And he doesn't he doesn't have as much... He doesn't have much... Um, uh, <laughs> he he uh, doesn't plan for things. I, I'd say um, he's amazing as a as a people person, but he doesn't like to sit down and think where are we actually going with this kind of thing. Which, if I remember correctly, was a really big skill of yours. Yeah, yeah. I think you... I definitely need to improve on the other side, whereas yeah, he needs to improve on this side. Well, you had the role of managing director within Sustain. Uh, which yeah. meant you had, um, which I've just got a message from Tracy Carter, who's, who's, who is another amazing lady. She's gone, wow, that's fantastic. Great partnership. Tracy Carter has actually been on this series as well. And she, you know, um, amazing lady in the fact that she started off just growing up in Bristol, 
going through the working in the council and ended up as the CEO, managing director, whichever one it was, of um, Bristol Waste. So, okay. like with a forty million budget and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, inspiring stories. Okay, so you, um, so what inspired you to start the business with your brother? I mean, the thing is, I think a lot of people would sit and they go, okay, so business in Mexico. Why would it? Why would I do something in England? How did it all come about? <laughs> okay, so. It all started with a bit of uh, problems, really. We went, we didn't go, go, oh, we need to go to Mexico to start a business. My brother was working in America, um, on Camp America, just as an 18-year-old, um, and he got a girl pregnant and decided to move out to Mexico to support the child and his girlfriend. Okay. Um, so then he was in Mexico. He was earning all right money as a tutor online, but he was very, he was at his desk every day, all day, and getting quite bored. Um, mm. And so he just realized, um, I think it was because he started by doing it for a neighbor, right? He was picking up the neighbor's groceries for, for his older neighbor. Um, and people kind of started to ask, oh, would you like do that for me if you're going to the market anyway? And it just slowly took off from that. Um, and then eventually we thought, why don't we try and actually organize this a bit better instead of just being a bit of casual work? And, and did you create the systems from scratch or did you use a, a platform that already exists? So to start with, we tried to use these things like Shopify, um, Wix, uh, WordPress even, but we we couldn't get enough. It's it's quite a weird system we've got to build because we've got the we have to get the orders in and the orders have to be sent out to different market stalls automatically. Otherwise, it takes hours. Um, so instead, I worked. We hired like a contractor, not for much. They not they don't cost. Uh, he was yeah, I think it. All in was about five hundred pound for for a fully functioning website and system to be built. Um, so I helped worked with this guy and we built um, the website up. That website hasn't actually been launched yet because I've said to my brother we need to get the finances straight before we start like improving the business. Otherwise, it's just gonna we're gonna have no idea where we are. But that website's ready to be launched as soon as we can. Excellent. Okay. So all right. So that's. I mean that's just fantastic. I, it's just, it, does that inspire you? Those kind of businesses? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I like, I like, especially when I've actually done made an impact, actually been involved, kind of thing. Okay, so at the moment, then we had a fantastic uh, chat before we went online about your university prospects. How yeah. they've gone so far? I mean, for somebody to you didn't take your A levels because of COVID. However, you did. You got the grades that you wanted to get, didn't you? I think. Did you, or was one a bit short? Uh, yeah, they were a bit. I mean, they, they got me into where I needed to go, but but didn't feel the school did me justice. But but yeah, it was alright. <laughs> <laughs> Ren thought the same actually with hers, but it's it is. It must be very difficult for them. So you told me earlier that you always had an inspiration to go to Oxford. Yeah. It didn't quite pan out that way, did it? We've you've sort of had an interesting journey. Tell me, tell me your journey of where you of, of you. Just tell me your university experience so far. Bearing in mind you started <laughs> you wanted to go to Oxford. How old were you when you wanted to go to Oxford? So I think I think I always wanted to go to Oxford just because I was kind of like uh, that's where smart people go, kind of thing. But that's not how I feel anymore. I, I think I don't think Oxford should be the be all and end all of anyone's um like life or in, in general i think you can be smart wherever you go um but i think it was just that inspired me and it kind of gave me a goal um, but when i got into a level i was taking too many a levels i was taking five pretty heavy a levels and i was just completely lost sight of why i was actually studying why did i want to do it which um, is and, let's clarify for a minute what's your area that you're interested in okay so i i studied maths further maths chemistry biology and physics and I'm interested in medicine now, uh, but also kind of tech in medicine, if possible, later on. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, I, so I kind of lost sight of what I wanted to do and ended up not applying to Oxford after wanting to for ages. Um, so, I, but I ended up getting offers to places in America. Um, and I think no one really, no one, uh, the only reason I decided to apply to America was because there was this charity that was offering a free trip to America if you got in. So I applied to this um, are charity. Give, are we going to give the charity a shout out? Yeah, yeah. So the Sutton Trust, 
Uh, so it's the Fulbright Commission, and then the, the subsidiary is the Sutton Trust. Okay. Um, and they do university programs across the whole of the UK, but also to the US. So I applied to this program basically just to get a free trip to the US. There was like at that point, I was set on I was set on going to a UK university. Didn't want to go to somewhere in the US. Um, mm -hmm. Ended up going out there and realizing just how much money each university had and how amazing their facilities were, and realizing that all of these private school kids were their teachers knew exactly that, that these universities were an amazing opportunity and they would go and apply. Um, so uh, you're, which, talking about the Ivy League. you're talking about the Ivy League universities, right? Yeah, Ivy League, MIT, the, the big universities out there, yeah. Okay. Um, and so then I thought, well, okay, I'll apply and I'll decide later um, and ended up getting into quite a few good universities um, and decided to pick one of them. Um, and they, so these, these deals were worth deals these scholarships um were worth like a quarter of a million each um yeah. and they were throwing them at kids like me because we came from normal backgrounds and the only people they have over there uh, are from very wealthy backgrounds and they kind of want to diversify their their british cohort i guess okay um yeah yeah we can, we're going to talk a bit about that in a minute, but let's finish the story. So you, because I remember when you were trying to make your decisions whilst we were working on Sustain Together, which was the name of the company that we that you formed during the Young Ent Enterprise, and you were very confused as to what you wanted to do, weren't you? One minute you were going that way, and then it was like, oh, that way. Yeah. <laughs> and it was almost like you had too many opportunities coming your way at the same time. I mean, some people would, you know, would be going, well, I'm going to have to go to Leeds because that's the only one I'm going to get the grades for or whatever. You had all these yeah. opportunities. So you picked one. Which one did you pick? So I ended up picking to go to Princeton. Um, to study? To, uh, so you study you study a general degree to start with. So I hadn't actually selected what I studied. You study kind of like the liberal arts, it's called, and then you you pick which section. So I'd go into engineering or physics or biology. Um, yeah, and so I started studying that, uh, but I actually started on a like pre-university course, um, and that was for people from low incomes to improve their essay writing. So I got one-on-one -on -one tuition with a professor from Princeton um, and these are quite big name professors um, and they gave me um, feedback on these essays I'd written about very um, things I'd never read before like oh god um, uh, we, we had to read the Declaration of Independence and discuss that and it was all these things I'd never done before and then a professor would grill me on my essay but it meant my writing ability grew like really well throughout that period and then COVID hit or COVID had already hit and my visa was basically said, sorry, you can't get a visa anymore. Your visa, you're not allowed to travel. Um, so they either said, I've got to stay in the UK and study or I can take a year out. And I decided to take a year out and apply to Oxford because I had, hadn't applied the year before. Um, and I applied to Oxford for medicine and, and then ended up getting into Oxford. You're doing this in the back of your head. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and, and I think to be honest though, I think a lot of Oxford luck and my interviewer was a clinical gen genologist, I don't know how to say it, and my sister has a very interesting genetic condition so we clicked very well on that and I knew a lot about genetics so I think it's all about who your interviewer is, how you click with them and things like that um, and it just worked I think. So that means now that you're going to be a Princeton dropout yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you're going to go and join uh, St. Peter's join College. Oxford. Yeah, Oxford. St. Peter's College in October, September, October. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's interesting. And, you, and you're going to do medicine there? Yeah. So we're going to have Dr. Ed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, or surgeon or something. Oh, or yeah, Mr. Ed if I'm a surgeon, yeah. It's Mr. Edges if you're a surgeon. Okay. Yeah. We're like talking about, let's talk, because obviously we're talking about money and wealth and all that kind of stuff. Did it ever cross your mind? You know, you're setting up businesses in Mexico. All right, it's in its infancy. You've had small it run-ins with, you know, test with little in, with businesses before of your own, but not really doing much. Did it ever cross your mind to not go to university and actually go down the entrepreneurial route? I think it definitely crossed my mind. Um, 
but the only the only reason I I wouldn't personally is if you get into a university that um, has the funds, then there's opportunity to get some of those funds off the university to start your own thing. For example, I I applied to a Princeton grant and got into the final eighteen to get twenty five thousand pounds, and they're just throwing money away at this point. Um, so it's kind of like there are opportunities at universities to be entrepreneurial. Um, but yeah, yeah. So I think it crossed my mind, but I, I never considered it seriously enough. Right. OK, so it's always been the university education. So do you have a vision of where you want to be in, say, 10 years time? What you want to be doing? Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I'd love to have some type of business. Um, now, I'm not, it doesn't have to be like a massive business. I, the biggest thing I'd love to do would be to help kids who are like me get into universities that I got into because I don't think there's anything special about me. I think I'm a smart kid, but I'm not, I'm not Harvard standard. I'm not Princeton standard, but somehow I got in. And I think it's, and I think giving people the guidance that were in the same position as me would be something I'd love to do. Um, yeah. That, that's, and that's really interesting because again, we're talking about sort of, it's about that kind of education. We actually watched a trailer of <laughs> the um, the Netflix film, The Varsity, uh, what was it, Operation Varsity, which yeah. is all about Rick Singer. And if anybody hasn't watched it on Netflix, please do, because it's absolutely fascinating watch. And you're going to go and watch it properly, aren't you? You really have to, Ed. It's, it's, yeah. But it's all about the scandal that happened, what was it, a couple of years ago now, I guess, where Rick Singer um who was um a tutor to the rich and famous um and it all went a little bit too far in the fact that basically um celebrity a and celebrity b's child who they really wanted to go to the top grades in the top universities that they they basically just bought their way in and it was interesting the way that you were telling me that you know that you were di you're a bit of a diversification for them and that yeah. they encourage you but you know i don't know how much that happens really I don't no know. yeah yeah but what do you so how do you think then how do you you sort of think that you've got to where you've got more by luck than judgment is that what you're saying well i think no i think luck is in who i've been put in contact with the charities that have helped me but I think there's a clear way to get into these universities or, or to boost your chances. But I think it's luck that I got onto that, that charity course. Uh -huh. Luck that I, yeah. And, and then when we went out to the US, it was like, I would just go and speak to anyone at the university. As in, there were some people walking past who were happy to speak to us and I'd get chatting with them. And then that's what gets me in because then when I submit my application, they go, that's the guy I spoke to like 10 months ago kind of thing but what we're talking about here is good communication skills right so is that what you're saying as well about teaching people good communication skills to get into university etc yeah i think it's definitely good communication skills um but that doesn't necessarily have to be kind of like um really good at speaking to someone necessarily it can be really good at showing the work you've already done and the interests you've already you've already done so someone who's maybe very very mathsy might not develop those communication skills um that someone who was doing something like medicine might but they can develop communication skills that that might not be they might not be the best communicator ever but they know how to show their work they know how to show the, the university why why the university should give them a load of money to study there um yeah, yeah. so people skills okay cool okay well that's so it's giving back as well so that's that's a nice that's a i mean just make sure you don't become the next singer, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we will stay away from that bit. Right. So let's let's talk about money. Okay. So before you came on today, I asked you to take my money type quiz, and just for the for the people who are watching who are watching this, I, I I've trained at the Money Coaching Institute, and they're one of the tools that they taught us, which is absolutely brilliant, is how to work with money types, which is a kind of archetype work. So um, I work with the eight money types who are all different characters who all, they're all fictitious characters and they all behave very differently when it comes to money. 
and the idea is is that we say that we have all of them within us so it's not like one of these personality type quizzes where you know they say you are this or you are that you know you're an attractor or a something or whatever this is all very very dynamic in the fact that you have all of the all of the eight within you and let's say your financial life is like like a bus we want to go well who's at the wheel you know have you got the fool at the wheel you know or have we got have we got the the tyrant at the wheel or have we got the victim at the wheel you know who have we got actually driving your financial life on purpose and out of the eight money types the three positive ones are the warrior the magician and the creator artist and the other five the innocent the victim the martyr the fool the tyrant and was that it was that five or was that four innocent the victim because i've done them in out of order now i forgot which so the in uh, the innocent the victim the martyr the fool and the tyrant are all the negative ones who we need to understand how they work but we don't really want them to be anywhere near the wheel of our financial bar and you took the quiz and you had some you had some good results and typically i would say as a young person um you didn't have any active money types which means that in my book if you put some real focus on your financial life if you thought about it and went i want to be good at this you could bring those positive scores right up and actually become the proficient person which i'm sure you really want to be when with when in, with in your money life but being the age that you are it's possibly not taking that role and you you know financial education what financial education did you get at school no nah, yeah none really do they teach you think, school really i think they, they teach you very basic tax ideas in the business i think um but nothing more than that nothing more than how much you're going to get taxed really Oh, really? It's funny, isn't it, that they go straight into how much you're going to get taxed rather than how to open a bank account? Yeah, like, I was never taught any of that. No, no sort of practical finance. No. It's interesting, isn't it? Because practical finance really has got to be the, one of the most, I mean, you can't really beat it, can you? Apart from the fact no, that yeah. it's extremely useful as well. I, I could understand that really mathsy people might avoid that because they go straight for the like the really complicated stuff. But what could be more important than practical finance? So as far as the world and money and opportunity and all that kind of stuff, how do you look at the world, Ed? Do you see it? Do you look at it positively? How do you feel about where the where you're going and where the world's going? Um, hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh, I think um, uh, I, I, I think the world's probably definitely going to go in, into more cashless and things to be automated with all the fintech space kind of like blowing up. I think there's going to be a lot of new ways to manage your money, but also a lot of new ways to spend your money. And whether you're going to go, you're either going to become amazing at managing your money or amazing at spending your money easily because it's becoming like easy to sign up for something and 10 quid a month is going out of your account every day every uh, month sorry um so yeah i'd say it's definitely going to get the fi fintech is going to grow more and more i guess um yeah what about so what's your view on cash do you think cash is going to be here in the next how long is it going to be around do you think i think a lot of people um oh, i think it's i think it's going to go pretty soon but i don't think it should go pre pretty soon um i think in my opinion, I think cash kind of, although illegal things happen with cash, it allows a little bit of unregulation in something, in otherwise something that would be completely regulated. And I think when you completely regulate something, it, it kind of puts a bit too much restriction on it. So I think cash is a good thing. Um, I also love, I would way rather find it a lot easier to save in cash than I do in a bank because you actually feel it, you love it, it's like there really um, <laughs> so that really really interesting that you say that isn't that is not what i expected you to say I'm <laughs> so you're really appreciating the tangibility of cash yeah yeah i don't like just seeing a number on an account i rather even though even though cash doesn't really have any value other than what we give it right like like cash is just paper in, in effect but i think actually having something that means 20 pound in front of you i think yeah, but maybe that's just because, yeah, of, of, yeah. Do you think, have you got any younger brothers and sisters? Uh, I have one younger sister and an older sister and an older brother. Because 
you're still of an age where cash was cash was the currency when you were growing up, right? Do you think that makes a difference? Like for so for kids that are growing up now that are like say I don't know coming up to ten sort of thing where they're really I mean like especially with COVID we've hardly used cash have we? Yeah. Well, I think it's probably yeah. Like when I'm when I was younger, my birthdays would be a case of opening a card and you'd have ten pound in the card and you'd collect a hundred pound by the end of the day and it'd be the best thing ever. So you, I think you're taught to start with that cash is money in effect, and then you learn that money can be put in a bank, kind of thing. So it, it I feel like you have a, like an affinity to cash when you're younger because you get it on your birthdays and you get it when you've done something good. You don't get someone depositing money into your bank. Oh, I didn't at the age of six, for example. No, well, not that you know, not that you know. Not that, yeah, yeah. I know it happens, but, so when you say it's good to have something that's unregulated, doesn't that then naturally bring us onto crypto? Yeah, so I, well, I think in, I think a lot of people are, well, I think a lot of critics of crypto say oh, it's unregulated, people are gonna buy drugs on it and buy knives on it and guns. And that was kind of a big, big problem people saw with crypto. But then it's like, how do people drop, buy drugs right now? They go and spend cash. How do people go and buy guns right now? They'll go give you cash. All of the the problems with crypto are the same as with cash. So it's not really an argument. I definitely think crypto or some form of crypto is going to be the future. I don't necessarily think it's going to be Bitcoin. Um, but there's a lot of promising what stuff. Think, what do you think about Bitcoin right now? So I think, I mean, what, Bitcoin's worth an immense amount of known trillions i think do you want me to tell um, you how many dollars it's worth today it's i think i it's 55 it's around fifty five thousand. i know that but the whole of bitcoin as a market is something like three trillion uh, or something, I think. Volume. okay yeah 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 it's uh so do you think it's here to stay or do you think other coins are going to come up i mean you know i mean i look at this world and i sort of to be honest I'm certainly not ahead of it. I might be just about hanging on to sort of going, I sort of know a bit about it. And yes, I've got some money invested in Bitcoin. But really, do I really know an awful lot about it? Not probably as much as I should for the amount I've got invested. However, you know, because so I don't know. What do you how much do you know about crypto? And all that? It's obviously stuff that you've learned by yourself, right? Yeah. So in my year off, I've been learning uh, quite a bit about it again i don't know i'm not an expert on crypto at all um but i, th I think people say bitcoin doesn't have an intrinsic value that's like a lot of investors arguments but uh, neither like what value does gold really have the only value is that it's scarce there's a scarcity of gold yeah. so it's valuable because there's hardly any and it's the same thing with bitcoin it's yeah. just people are accepting a, instead of something tangible they're accepting an online like code basically to say you've got bitcoin um but i think that gives its value in it in itself but but bitcoin probably won't be used as a as a um to be transacted with a lot because it costs so much to send a bitcoin it costs it uses so much energy but you'd never go and pay someone in a gold bar either so it's still i think it'll stay because it's just a value holder and then other coins will be used as kind of transactions because there, there are a number of um, like retailers and all that kind of stuff or organisations that are developing their own coins. And then there are tokens as well. I don't really understand about all those. Yeah. Coins. Yeah. Madness. <laughs> you think, so when you're if you look at your peers now, do you I mean, obviously, it's a stupid question to ask. I mean, obviously, everybody's different. But do you generally sort of communicate with all this stuff are you sort of like at the same level as your peers or do you have all your mates that you talk about all this kind of stuff with or are you doing this on your own sort of so well because i've had because i've had so much time then i've learned quite a bit about it but my that's what i find interesting even people my age know know a, a decent amount about it and we talk about it for example we go out for a beer and and it'll come up in conversation and i think that just shows it's promising just the fact you're talking about. I never go to a uh, a bar and talk about an IRA or like a FTSE 500 anymore. You go and talk about the new thing, the cryptos, the, the things like that. Um, so I definitely think it's promising. Yeah, like you say, just because we're talking about it and everyone knows a little bit about it. 
So do okay, and um, and obviously about different coins. You were telling me about a coin that you've been investing in recently, and you've been trading. Well, I don't know if you intentionally traded it. Did you intentionally trade it over a couple of months, or did you? What was your intention with it? Yeah, so I bought it because so I just invest in things that it, basically small coins are like startups. They have some project, and if you believe in the project, you should invest in it, kind of thing. So I I uh, really liked this one project and what it was doing, and it was bringing something to. Um, the BSC, which is a type of crypto, like a side of crypto, um, that hadn't been brought before. Um, so I invested quite a bit in that at like 340, and now it's gone up to $15 a coin from 340. And I mean, I don't have enough money to be making loads on it, but even just seeing the possibilities is quite is quite good. So, but but bearing in mind now that if your trade, let's just say that was your trading pot. Yeah. Trading pot is now quite significantly larger than it was before. Yeah. And if we're, let's say, I mean, I don't know, when I was talking about trading, when it was trading stocks, people were saying that, it'd be, you know, you can easily make 3% where well, you can, you can make, I'm not going to say easily, you can make 3% a month, which is actually pretty good. You know, yeah. yeah. Well, it's good, but it's also quite reserved if you're talking to Forex traders. Yeah. What's, have you ever been interested in anything like that in Forex? Yeah, so I try. The, the reason I think I I was, so I, I traded in forex for a bit, nothing serious again. But the reason I didn't like it was because compared to crypto, crypto's so much quicker. So I can learn in half the time because it fluctuates so much. So I can think, yeah, I can try. I mean, I'm nowhere near an expert. I can try and look at signals and things like that. And even if I'm not right, it's happened in half the time. So I haven't wasted a, a year or even a month thinking about if it's going to go up or down, it can go up 10% every day kind of thing. So you can understand it like that. But but I've, uh, did you hear about um, uh, GameStop? I did. Uh, yeah. So GameStop, things like that are interesting me now, just because I like the fact that the big top dogs are having some pressure put on them. Um, and there's another one called AMC, which is a uh, American entertainment company, where they're shorting the American entertainment company um, and people are plumbing a load of money in so that the hedge funds have to buy back 10 times higher and then they'll lose a load of money. Um, so I think the thing like that are just exciting to watch and be a part of, even if it's only a few hundred pounds. Mm, it's interesting. It stirs things up, though, on a, on a bit of a worrying scale sometimes, doesn't it, though? Because yeah. it, all the people that have been, you know, doing your back testing and all that kind of stuff can all of a sudden be sort of thrown off thrown yeah. off the fence. So when you're when you're you know we're in the last year where we've been going through COVID etc. We're over a year now. How have you coped during lockdown? How's that affected you? I've coped quite well. I think it was because I was working too hard that it meant I could just completely have a break. Uh, like I've I've had a year to go and read what I want to read, learn what I want to learn, chill when I want to chill. Kind of, I, I mean, I haven't been able to travel, but that's probably been good because it's meant I've had to be at home and not do anything, kind of thing. So for me, I think it's been good because it's given me time to reflect and and kind of chill out a bit. Um, and I'm very highly strung, so normally I don't chill out, and I'll you don't, continue working. No, I know exactly. No. What, I remember having <laughs> you doing young enterprise, going, Ed, everything's going really well, but if you carry on like this, you're not going to be going forever. <laughs> yeah but it's about learning it's about learning that work-life balance isn't it and actually because I've just been reading a book all about self-love and looking after yourself and actually the importance of it and it, it even though I obviously I thought I knew the importance of it it's it, some of the things in this book really struck home and thought yeah even though it sounds a little bit woo-woo and probably a bit pansy maybe but to some people it's a really important thing to do because unless you look after yourself, then you have to have that selfishness to look after yourself first. Because if not, you're not going to be able to do anything. Where was your martyr, by the way? It's only nine percent. You're all right. It's okay. And the martyr. That's the martyr usually looking after everybody else before they look after themselves. <laughs> so yeah. when we look at that, when we're looking at the media, which I don't know whether you look at or not, do you generally? Yeah, I, I mean, I, yeah, no, I look at yeah, I look at the media. So do you? In my book, we've got the media, right, which is huge and so negative and literally repetitive, negative. The energy of it 
is just like oh god you know i just i can't be doing with it really hearing about the same old thing again and such petty subjects in my in my view and then we've got positive news over here which we don't really get to see what are you looking at most yeah so so i um I mean, if you if you go through like any social media, there's always going to be your average news kind of stuff that is very negative and very kind of like tries to anger you or upset you so that you'll click it and they get the clicks. Um, but I think I was watching something the other day. I think it was Justin Can, who is the founder of Twitch or one of the founders of Twitch, which is like a billion dollar company. And he said it, the biggest or one of the biggest lessons he learned, I think it was him, is that people always say the five people you hang around with yeah will you'll be that person so why do you not take that into like the five biggest bits of content you're taking in will be who you are yeah. um but i only read that the other day but it kind of like inspired me to go and seek out some positive news um, and some good things that are happening instead of just relying on the media to give me to give yeah. me the angry things kind of thing. and there is actually there's actually a brilliant thing <clears throat> i'm just gonna have a quick look up for it now it's called I, I actually I subscribe to it, Positive Dot News, and it. Oh no, I can't remember. Yeah, I think it's actually called Positive Dot News. Um, it's really good, and it's like a magazine, and you can get the online version of it. And you know, they actually have what went well this week. You know, it's really yeah. nice. Email through, but amazing things like how the, the the orangutan population in borneo has doubled since or quadrupled or something since 1989 and how they're um you know i don't know just using all fantastic yeah. technology how the good parts of the world are coming through and I, I think from my point of view as somebody who you know i'm obviously old enough to be a great grandmother but it's i've learned over the years that what we focus on to a certain extent can be what we get and it worries yeah. it worries me very deeply that with the social media that young people see and with all the negative news etc of how that affects us so how do you think that we can change that going forward i mean i know you're looking at positive stuff but what about people around you because you're going to you're going to want to start helping people into university to actually be making the best of themselves do you see that as being sort of part of it yeah, so I think I think I yeah I think um, we're never gonna change the media. We're gonna have to change like ourselves, kind of thing. Like you said, like the media is always gonna try and get the most clicks, and whatever gets the most clicks, they'll do. So it, I guess it is a case of everyone trying to actively seek out good news um, instead. I mean, I said, but um, you know, for me, I've always said that if people stop reading the Daily Mail, they'd have to stop printing it, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah wants to read it then they're not gonna you know yeah for, for as long as we want it they're going to carry on sending yeah. it to us i mean i definitely think i definitely think a lot of that there's massive problems with mental health and people being down at the moment um and i think a lot of that is to do with the media both the media being always kind of grumpy down and dreary um and then combine that with all the problems with COVID, people losing their jobs and all of this is a big problem with mental health. And I don't really think people, people who are in the positions to do something understand it properly. I don't think people understand how serious it is in kids at the moment and how many of my friends have experienced really, really down and dark places. Um, and I think it's because the people who are in charge are so out, out of touch with what it is like. Um, yeah yeah and and this is the same that you were talking about earlier when you were talking about opportunities for university and the fact that the people at your school just didn't have that knowledge in the way to push you and we were talking yeah. about weren't we the can do the can do um view and the you know you're going to be lucky if you get this son yeah yeah, yeah definitely and it's the same thing. So it's a tricky one. So what do you think could have, could really help people of your age or with mental health? What could be a solution? Have you got any ideas? What you what you lot you know what you need? Well, I think I think there should definitely be. I mean, but I, I suppose there's always push for education and everything, new education programs and stuff. But I do think schools should take a bigger responsibility. Um, like the the school I was at, 
when I, when I got really stressed about university results and I was very anxious all the time and, and struggling and I went and asked for help, I was told there was a wait list and I couldn't get help. And it's like, you're in a school where <laughs> these things should be first priority. Um, it doesn't matter. Like there, sh there should be funding. We don't need a, the, the, uh, the classrooms to be painted every year. We need people who actually need help to get the help they need. Um, mm. And I'm not saying like, I, I was very on the very low end of that. I hardly needed any help and I was okay after, but I know people who needed help, couldn't get help mm. and spiraled and went absolutely really, really bad for them. Um, mm. And I don't think it's that the funding's not there. I think it's that we're not using it correctly. Um, right yeah. Yeah, like building music blocks and things like that. And actually with music, <laughs> building building blocks for subjects that nobody they don't really get a teacher for and that there's not yeah. really much interest in. Yeah, I know. And I'm not picking out on this school, this is just an example because I think Yeah, in, in yeah, it's not Balcaris, it's kind of like yeah. every school has has issues and every school's given funding and then but with tied conditions that they have to use it for certain things. Um yeah. I think I one of the things I think is really interesting and something that I found when I was um you know looking at education obviously I've got two daughters as well and it does seem that you know we've got an education system and that's what it is and this is what it does and this is how we do it and essentially we've maneuvered a, we've got ourselves through the years where essentially we're teaching people how to pass exams yeah yeah agreed yeah Covid's turned that upside down, really, hasn't it? Because we've got, if you think about the subjects that you have, um, I mean, like, you know, because uh, we used to have, what are they called? The exams where you don't have to take, you don't have to do the, the qualifications where you don't have to take the exams at the end. It's more coursework. And then it's changed all the way back again to just taking exams at the end, right? So, you, yeah. I, for me, I would, I would, writing essays just was not my forte just give me a multiple choice and a couple of open-ended questions and I could sail through it but and also project work I was really good at so to go back to the situation whereby you get to the end of your course and you take exams that's slightly backfired a bit hasn't it yeah yeah we can't do that with covid yeah so I wonder what we can do going forward then to make sure that people are properly assessed yeah well I, I think I mean, it's obviously really, a really hard to, way to do it, but I don't think, like, there's so much pressure put on kids, even from, like, your, your year six exams to your GCSEs to your A-levels. Um, and I don't think it's, like, school should be a time for you to go and figure out what you want to do. It shouldn't be a time for you to put all your energy into studying one single subject or one single thing. Like you say, it should be there should be financial lit literacy classes. There should be stuff on mental health. It shouldn't just be science history classes like that that should be part of it but they should only be there to kind of like give you a foundation to go learn in depth at university um but if you haven't got these foundations in finance in um mental health in Parenting cooking stuff. even parent yeah everything like that then you're yeah, you're going to struggle when you go yeah and and all of these things with with um toxic relationships um and abusive relationships it's because you're not taught what a proper relationship should be look like from the age of, of secondary school when you're going to start being in relationships. Do you think that's got anything to do with social media, though? Do you think that's got the fact to do the, with, I mean, how old were you when you got your first mobile phone? Probably start of secondary school. I know, so probably younger than that, but my first, like, proper, yeah, phone. So, because I know, I know full well that even with my two girls, and Connie's older than you, just slightly older than you, and Ren's younger, they don't want to have conversations with people. Conversations is actually a text. I was talking yeah. to, yeah, but you weren't talking, were you? You were texting. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. interesting, isn't it? And actually having those conversations about picking up the telephone and speaking to the doctor or, you know, booking a table at a restaurant, I know for some people is like, is difficult. Yeah. So if you're in an education system where the teachers didn't grow up with social media. That's where the, the stuck thing is, isn't it? Yeah. You don't think that you should have to teach somebody how to have a conversation because you sort of think it's natural, but it, it but it isn't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like I'd hate to ring the doctors um when I was was younger. I'd I'd get my mum to do it because and I don't no one like you don't know why, but it's probably because you've never had to do it before. 
um, whereas everyone else has kind of thing. Yeah. So that's that's quite it. So really, we do need a, a complete ruffle up of the education system. Yeah. Yeah. So, OK, we're not going to go on for too much longer, but I do want to just ask you a couple of things about your your start with money. Right. Because um, we know that you're not you don't come from a sort of a massively privileged family because of your pauper status at Princeton. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, uh, which is hilarious but what did you learn with, about money when you were growing up um i think well i think my family's been in in times of times of wealth uh quite a bit of wealth and times of not much money at all and so i think the contrast has definitely taught me um because i've had times where we've struggled for cash and we've had to ask school or like government for support um and it makes you realize how valuable cash is and how you really need to really need to um be on top of things because like your situation can change in a matter of weeks yeah yeah it, it, it's interesting i was reading i'm reading a you book didn't have much money you... and oh sorry yeah you got a bit frozen then. sorry yeah so i think just experiencing the two extremes um has been good because it's meant i've understood that you need to be good with money but you also need to understand when you should spend money kind of thing and when you should give yourself some some relax yeah relaxation i was the book i'm reading at the moment which is here actually it's called the psychology of money really good read actually i'm very much enjoying it and i'm just reading at the um it's the the what's it the, the chapter's called um getting wealthy versus staying wealthy and yeah quite an interesting thing for me because i you know i it's um it it you know all about making money and making more money and you know why you shouldn't have the mentality that you just think that you should just have enough money to pay the bills and there's no reason why you shouldn't have the mindset you shouldn't be sloshing around with money or you know as you know keep keep sloshing about money i'm trying to find this fantastic quote in here which basically was saying that they were talking about these guys that got really rich and then they lost their money and then there were other people that so they talk about warren buffett and how one of the guys um, he had to buy this buy this, the stock. One of his partners, he bought stock from them because he was leveraging himself too much and all that kind of stuff. There was a brilliant quote in here, and I was just trying to find it, which was basically saying that it's very easy to get rich. It's actually really um, keeping money. Here you go. Getting money requires taking risks, being optimistic and putting yourself out there. But keeping money requires the opposite of taking risk. It requires humility and fear. That what you've made can be taken away from you is away from you just as fast. It requires frugality and an acceptance that at least some of what you've made is actually attributable to luck. So past success can't be relied upon to repeat in, in sorry to repeat indefinitely. So it was basically talking <laughs> talking about that it's all very well to to have uh, money, but what you should be is slightly paranoid and a bit fearful and also a bit frugal. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because I think if, if a lot of people who win the lottery have millions and then 10 years later have nothing. And it's because, like, even even £5 million, realistically, you could blow. You could, you could go and spend it on the wrong things and it would be gone. Whereas if you spend it on the right things, if you invest in property or things like that, then that wealth will make you wealth kind of thing so you don't need to yeah yeah 70 apart the figures are apparently 70 percent of big time lottery winner ringers winners go bankrupt and yeah. also and also rich sports people too especially um american footballers but it this is the thing money tends to magnify who you already are so if you're a big spender and somebody gives you just more money you just you're not going to be you're just going to be even bigger spender yeah um, yeah so you know it's it that's that's usually the way that it works in that way and yes yeah, so that's true so okay so you you noticed the difference and actually so that the money that you have got you like to be you 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 keep you want to keep keep hold of it do you have any kind of systems or methods that you live by do you have a sort of like that these are my rules of how you look after your money um I think uh, I, I so I have like the money I can spend and then like a pot. So I will put every time I reach five hundred, I'll put into a, into the pot. 
Um, so then I can't spend what's in the pot unless it's like a big purchase. If I wanted a laptop and I needed a laptop and I could justify it, then I'd go into the pot. Um, mm -hmm. But it means I can, I stop frittering money on like going out to eat all the time um, and things like that. Do you but my spending habits aren't great. They're not great. Okay. Well, you didn't no, I don't. I don't. I don't like track it kind of thing, which I, which, which is something I'd like to do when I have time in the future. So why? Do, what about if I was to suggest to you an app, something like Money Dashboard? Yeah, like something like that. I need to start using. Well, so just log in and just put your accounts in there, and all of a sudden you're tracking. Boom! That's that. That's quite, That's that answer for you. But it was interesting though, because do you ever do you ever think about um, what we what I call a financial freedom pot, which is I think we talked about this during Young, Young Enterprise, and it's basically in a pot that you put money in that you're never going to spend, or you just assume that you're never going to spend it. So with the benefit of compound, right, compound interest. Yeah. So they say that Warren Buffett, the most in successful investor that we've ever known, whatever, apparently he didn't really see massive, massive, the huge amount of wealth that he's got until he was about 65. Even yeah. And... That's because he's and he started investing when he was 10. Oh, uh, yeah. So it's all it's got it all in this book, actually. It's very interesting about how much how much money he had at a certain point. I'm trying to see if I can try and find it. But yeah, about how he didn't really get his money until after he was 65. When I say he didn't really get his get much money, I mean, he had plenty of money before. Let's not be let's not get this wrong. But do you think about now if you were to start investing now? And just putting money into an investments at your age and with the view that you're not going to take anything out. Have you worked out how that can serve you if you take a, even like a, even if you were to look at something like a four percent annual increase? Right. Which is pretty conservative. Yeah, I've seen. So I think it's like seven percent is doubles in 10 years, doesn't it? I think I think it's seven percent is the rule of 72. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you do that. No, and that yeah I, i've looked at it before um i think the only problem for me would be i it would have to be i wouldn't be able to see it like if i could see i've got three thousand pounds then i'd be more willing i'd think oh, i'll spend that whereas if i put it in something where it was blank and didn't tell me how much i had um or i genuinely couldn't take it out then okay. that'd be different um what about yeah. if i described it to you like this that if you think about, let's say, for instance, let's take your ISA. So you've got a £20,000 a year ISA allowance, which you can put money into, which is yours tax free, basically. It's a tax free way of doing it. And as long as you don't keep taking it out, put it back in, take it back out, however long that goes, unless you pop your clock, so you'll be able to take the money out of there tax free. Yeah. So let's say, for instance, you looked at your, your ISA and you started putting in, I don't know, even a couple of hundred a month, right? Um, I've yeah. got a little part that I'll get, I'll show you actually of showing you some figures on how it works. You'll be amazed at how it works. Um, but if you were to consider, you know, um, Jack and the Beanstalk. Yeah. And you know they had um, Jack came back with the golden with the golden goose, and his yeah. mum said, "What are you doing with the golden goose, you stupid boy? What you need is you need, you know, you went off with the beans. You want to go and find gold or whatever it was." And he goes, "No, no, 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 because I've got the golden goose. And what does the golden goose lay?" Yeah, go next. Go next. So if you think about if you think about the future and you think about um, generating wealth for your future, the lot taking the the rule of compounding, which is the eighth wonder of the world, right? Because it just yeah, you know, it's going on. If you had an account called your financial freedom account, which in your mind looked like a golden goose, what you do is you keep feeding the golden goose and fatten it up, so you it gives you beautiful golden eggs. Yeah. So then yeah. for, therefore you would say, but if I could see it, I'd take it. But why would you kill a golden goose? Yeah, 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 true. Does that yeah. help at all? Yeah, no, I, yeah, I think some, thinking something like that would definitely help. Um, I also, I, have you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad? I have, very much so, yeah. I like, the, I like the, the idea in there as well, where it's like every pound you put in is a little man working for you That's to it. make more money. Yeah every give yeah. every pound a purpose i always say give every pound a purpose yeah no yeah. Really, really really so yeah it's it's interesting in it isn't it with financial education i seriously need to get onto the young person's financial education i really have a calling for this i would love to go <laughs> into, to do it and set up some kind of scheme to go into schools well, and stuff. well i think a lot of people as well will go to 
um, university because they not, not because they want to go to university, but because they believe that's the way to get their money, for example. But if you it, and they're not advertised at all, but all these apprenticeships, I know people have done apprenticeships and are much ahead of me in terms of the amount of money they've got. They've almost got enough to put uh, to house, uh, deposits down on houses um, and things like that. And it's like if this was advertised so much more then people would go and do it and realize that university isn't the only way forward. And it is a university is a good way forward. Like I'm not trying to down, put down university, but people need to realize that they can get wealthy by doing an apprenticeship, earning, putting their earnings in savings, saving up. And, that, and like, that's another way forward. And I don't think it's put forward enough. No, I completely agree with you. But I also think that there are a lot of kids that come out of school and go into university because they don't know what else they want to do. Yeah, true. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. they want to go and have three years of a of a piss up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I, get, I get that. I get that as well. Ed, look, it's been absolutely amazing talking to you. I could talk to you all day. Um, I want to really thank you for coming and talking to us today. I'm going to be following you and following your your <laughs> path, your career path, and your life path because it re absolutely fascinates me. Um, everything that you said today just really sings to my heart and actually helping young people just have all of those skills is something that interests me massively. Um, so good luck with Oxford. Will you come back yeah. and talk again and tell us how you're getting on? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'd love you to do that. Let me just say goodbye to everybody. Um, thank you, everybody, for watching this. Whether you're watching this on YouTube, whether you're watching this live, or whether you're watching it replay, please um, post the comments. It's always lovely to hear your feedback. Um, I will be back in a couple of weeks um, with another fabulous guest who's got a great story. And until then, um, thank you all for watching. Oh, I also wanted to say that I am going to be hosting a webinar on Tuesday night which is all about discovering your money drivers and how that they could how they hold you back from becoming the best person you can be financially and how to just get rid of them. So I'm going to put the link. I'll put the link below this video if you want to come and join us next Tuesday. Um, that would be really good. And uh, just for now, thank you very much. And I will speak to you speak to you soon. Thank you very much. Bye bye.